after tapping all their resources, investigators are unable to link a killer to his crime. Will six beer bottles make a case? A woman is pulled from her watery grave. The only witnesses have taken wing. Detectives must use an empty cocoon to catch a murderer. A shrewd serial poisoner stays one step ahead of the law. To stop him, investigators need to rouse a confession from a graveyard of deleted computer files. Police rarely have the benefit of smoking guns or bloody fingerprints to solve crimes. After the obvious leads grow cold, detectives with an eye for detail can use science to probe the most unlikely sources. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. November 1996. Friday the 13th. A man and his dog took their usual morning stroll past the soccer fields at the YMCA in Columbia, South Carolina. But on this day, something stopped them in their tracks. What he thought was a childish prank turned out to be frighteningly real. Face down in the grass lay the motionless body of a woman. Her hair was covered with blood. Authorities confirmed that the woman was dead, shot several times in the head at close range. Using her body temperature as a gauge, they estimated that she had died just hours before, sometime between 3 and 4 that morning. Investigators scoured the grass. Not knowing what might yield a clue, they photographed and collected all the litter found around the body. The shoulder pad from a woman's blouse might have been ripped out during a struggle. An empty purse pointed to robbery as the motive. Two empty beer bottles could hold a killer's fingerprints. It was too soon to tell. Expanding their search, police found evidence of more immediate value. Three shell casings and two spent slugs. This told investigators that the woman had been shot at this location, not simply dumped here. Also, it gave them the basis for a ballistics comparison. But first, they'd need a suspect, and before they could find one, they'd need to know who the victim was. The body was brought to Richland Memorial Hospital where she was identified from fingerprints as 30-year-old Virginia Russell. She'd had a police record for driving while intoxicated. Back in the lab, the forensics case was at a standstill. Technicians could find no physical link to the killer. The shoulder pad was a dead end. The fingerprints on the beer bottles were too smeared to identify. The body was lacking any foreign hairs, fibers, or other samples that might link a suspect to the crime. Sergeant. Detectives Sergeant. turned to friends and family. Cream, sugar? No, it's fine, thanks. In talking to the victim's aunt, investigators learned that the hospital where her body yeah. now lay was actually the last place Virginia was seen alive. She had spent the last night of her life visiting her cousin's sick baby. Relatives were pleased to see that after a struggle with alcoholism, Virginia Russell was turning her life around. 
Since taking a new job at a nighttime cleaning service, her wallet was always filled with cash. This made detectives speculate about robbery as a motive. No wallet had yet been found. They probed for more information. The aunt remembered Russell's beeper going off. When Russell returned the page, she was overheard taking directions to an address in the neighborhood of Olympia. But Russell wasn't heading out to clean an office. Nor was that the line of work that paid her bills. As another family member conceded to police, Virginia Russell was a call girl working for an escort service. The job put her in the company of any number of shadowy characters, most of whom concealed their identities. With such a suspect list, the case would be challenging, if not impossible, to solve. But police caught a break. The day after the body was discovered, they found her car in a parking lot in Olympia. There was blood on the console. In the back seat, inside its carrier, was a single bottle of Michelob Light, the same brand found near her body. The car was towed to the police lab, where technicians searched for fingerprints, hair, and fiber. They found nothing. They took blood samples from the dashboard. It matched the victim's blood type. Russell must have been shot at least once while in the car. Detectives had come a step closer to piecing together the actual crime, but they were nowhere in their manhunt. When Sergeant Andrew Caldwell of the Richland County Sheriff's Office learned about the murder, he suspected that it wasn't an isolated incident. He was puzzling over a rape case at the time and wondered if the same brutal individual could be responsible for both crimes. His theory was based on more than a hunch. One of the major similarities were both were employed by escort services as call girls, uh, as well as the location of Virginia Russell's car Virginia Russell's vehicle was found within eyesight of the apartment uh, where the sexual assault had occurred uh, earlier. If Caldwell could solve the rape case, he might catch a killer in the process. On the evening of November 10th, three days before Virginia Russell's death, a 20-year-old call girl was dropped off in Olympia by a driver from the service. She was to meet a man who said his name was Daniel Davis. The man attacked her almost immediately. If she wanted to live, he told her, she'd have to comply with his every whim. He dragged her to the bedroom and sexually assaulted her. After the attack, he emptied the young woman's wallet and threw her out of the house. As she wandered, dazed, into the neighborhood, her assailant drove away. She got one last look at his face before calling for help. Daniel Davis was a fake name. The apartment, investigators learned, was rented to a man named Roy Beck, Jr., who matched the description the victim gave police. His was a familiar name around the department. A series of burglaries had kept him in and out of trouble since his teenage years. From a computerized database, investigator Randy Strange compiled a group of images from a library of mugshots. By bringing up the specifics of the suspect as far as age, race, height, hair color, the computer automatically gives us possible candidates that match the suspect. Like Roy Beck, all of the men were in their mid-twenties, around 5'5", with dark hair. 
From that lineup, the victim identified Roy Beck Jr. as her attacker. Officers went to Beck's apartment to arrest him for the attack on the call girl, but he was one step ahead of them. They found the place abandoned and in disarray. The power had been turned off. Beer bottles and other garbage were strewn on the floor. Armed with a search warrant, investigators combed through the mess, looking for clues linking Beck to the rape. They found ammunition for various guns. Detectives thought they had found a positive link between Beck and the murder of Virginia Russell. But none of the ammunition matched the fatal bullets. Investigators directed their energy into finding Beck. To get their hands on him, they set up a sting. They obtained an arrest warrant for the sexual assault, then contacted Beck's old girlfriend. We were able to persuade her into helping us uh, find him. She paged him and he returned the page and uh, asked for her to come pick him up at an apartment complex in town. emerged from his hideout to meet her, he was arrested and brought to the station for questioning. In the meantime, detectives went upstairs to the apartment where Beck had been hiding out. The apartment belonged to Beck's friend, Richard Bulliard. Bulliard consented to a search and pointed investigators to a loaded gun on the sofa. That wasn't the only weapon they found. We were able to locate a large uh, Rambo-style hunting knife, which was described by our rape victim and used in that crime, as well as a phone book in Beck's room that he was using with various escort services uh, underlined and highlighted. The gun, knife, and a pair of boots were collected and brought to the lab, where the first solid links to Virginia Russell's murder were forged. Ballistics proved that the gun found in Bulliard's apartment was used to kill Russell. The boots had blood on them, consistent with the victim's type. Not me, man. Yeah. With the evidence mounting against him, it seemed impossible that Beck could dodge a murder conviction. But he did his best to wriggle out of it by laying the blame on his friend, Richard Bulliard. The gun was in fact registered to Bulliard, and, Beck argued, the boots belonged to him too. Investigators couldn't deny that all the evidence was found in Bulliard's, not Beck's, apartment. Investigators were at an impasse. The rape victim's testimony had established Beck's violent pattern of call girl solicitation and robbery, but that evidence was circumstantial at best. Without tangible clues, investigators had no way of proving beyond reasonable doubt that Beck had ever been with Russell or that he, and not Bulliard, had fired the gun. With the case crumbling before their eyes, detectives had to gamble on a long shot. The only physical evidence that connected Roy Beck, Virginia Russell, and Virginia Russell's car was six Michelob light beer bottles. Investigators had found two empty bottles next to the body, three empty bottles in Roy Beck's abandoned apartment, and one unopened bottle in the victim's car. If they could be shown to have come from the same six-pack, it would prove that Beck had been with Russell that night. But without usable fingerprints, linking the beer bottle seemed impossible. Anheuser-Busch distributes almost 200 million bottles of Michelob Light each year. Finding a connection between the six bottles seemed remote. Without it, Roy Beck would go free. To tie a murderer to his crime, Detectives in South Carolina had the improbable task of proving that six bottles of beer 
came from the same six-pack. For help, they turned to the Anheuser-Busch bottling plant in Williamsburg, Virginia. In turn, Mark Landers, manager of quality assurance, relied on a coding system the company had adopted just that year. The code in question was 17 October 96, and the other four characters were WF58. The first part of the code showed that the beer was bottled on October 17, 1996. The W stood for the Williamsburg plant, and the F indicated a particular line within the system. The final part of the code, 58, specified that the beer was bottled during the 58th 15-minute increment on that day. As the bottles are packaged and labeled, they are placed in six-pack carriers and in a case. All of the bottles produced during a 15-minute time period will contain the same exact code. In Lander's expert opinion, the beer bottles in Beck's house had come from the same carrying case as the bottles found near the victim. It was an irrefutable argument that locked Beck to his crime. Sought as a last-ditch effort, the beer bottles enabled detectives to piece together Virginia Russell's final hours with Beck. After leaving the hospital, her escort service sent her to Beck's home, where they drank the first three beers from the six-pack. Police surmised that when Virginia stepped out of the room, Beck discovered the stash of money in her purse. Police theorized that they grabbed the beer and drove to a soccer field where they drank the fourth and fifth <laughs> bottles. At some point, Beck decided that robbing his victim wasn't enough. He wanted to kill her. He shot her in the head, dragged her out of the car, and shot her twice more. He then drove away, abandoning her car within walking distance of his apartment. He left behind the final unopened beer, and with it, the clue that experts needed to link him to the crime. I remember during the testimony, Beck's defense attorney listening to this testimony, putting his head in his hands and shaking as if he didn't know how to recover from this very damaging testimony that was occurring. And it was at that point I really felt good about the case and knew that we had Beck and he would probably be convicted. By paying strict attention to the most banal of clues, detectives made sure that Beck would pay for his crime. He was sentenced to life in prison. Sometimes it's not the evidence that's so improbable, but rather the unlikely way in which it's found. In western Michigan, the cool, brisk current of the Muskegon River is a popular summer attraction for canoers, fishermen, and inner tubers. But in June of 1989, its peaceful waters divulged a violent secret. Two recreational divers were scavenging the river bottom for sunken treasure. Dropped motors, lost fishing tackle, old anchors. A flash of metal told them they were onto something big, bigger than they thought. It was a red car, belly up in a 15-foot indentation. And there was something floating inside it. Peering through the windows, the divers saw the bloated figure of a human body. They contacted the police. As the car was removed from the water, authorities and spectators could only wonder at the identity of the body inside, how the car had gotten into the water, and for how long the river had concealed this dismal grave. A fully clothed woman was removed from the car. Despite having been submerged in water, the remains were well preserved. Investigators searched the body and the vehicle for identification, 
but all they found was mud, insect larvae, and cocoons. The body was taken to the medical examiner's office. In the meantime, investigators searched the area, trying to figure out how the car got into the river. The vehicle had little body damage. The nearby overpass showed no indication of a car accident. Galen Brookins, the chief of police from nearby Fremont, looked for other points of entry. One of the theories that we had entertained was that it was possible for a motor vehicle to come down this trail, which other vehicles obviously had, and to end up in the river at this point in a very straight trajectory. The strong current had carried the car to the other side of the pilings, where it finally settled in a deep ditch. Because the car had landed in a deep ditch, it was impossible to see it from the surface. Detectives hoped that the autopsy would disclose the secrets that the river had kept hidden. The medical examiner had two tasks, to help identify the body and to find out how she died. Dental x-rays and fingerprints were taken in the hopes of giving a name to this Jane Doe. Head wounds pointed to the cause of death. This woman didn't die in a car accident. She had been struck at least six times with a hard, blunt object. The medical examiner could also determine that she was dead before she went into the river. Someone had tried to conceal her body by pushing her vehicle into the murky depths. While the autopsy was being performed, police ran a search on the vehicle identification number. They learned that the car belonged to David Smith, a nursing home employee who lived not far from the Muskegon River. The discovery of the car and disclosure of David Smith's name raised eyebrows at the nearby Fremont Police Department. Nine months earlier, on October 2nd, Smith had paid a visit to the station. He came to report his wife missing. At the time, police suspected nothing more than a typical domestic dispute and a spouse who was blowing off some steam. He and his wife had had a disagreement and she had left uh, on Friday evening, September 30th, and that he had not seen her since that time. Smith told police that his five-year marriage to Hai Yan, a Korean national, had turned sour. After their latest screaming match, she threw a plate at him, then climbed into her car and drove off. After the officer had interviewed him, he had in indicated that uh, he should take in contact relatives and friends and try to determine if any of them had heard from her and then report back to our department. But months passed without any follow-up from David Smith, nor any sign of the missing woman or her car. When detectives checked up on Smith, they were surprised at what they found. Police learned from interviews with friends and family that Smith was hardly acting like a grieving spouse. Just four days after reporting his wife missing, he had filed for divorce. He'd been actively dating since and wasted no time in pawning Hai Yan's jewelry. Clearly, Smith didn't expect to hear from Hai Yan ever again. Though his behavior was suspicious, it was not illegal. The situation had all the ingredients of a homicide, except there was no body. Police were determined to find Hai Yan, dead or alive. In February 1989, four months before the body was recovered, Brookins turned to the Michigan State Police for help. State Police worked the phones, contacting friends of the missing woman in the US and Korea. No one had seen or heard from her since September. Now missing for five months, investigators were losing hope that Hai Yan would ever surface. As he proceeded with telephone interviews, Detective Richard Miller of the state police uncovered a lie. 
Though David Smith told law enforcement that he had heard nothing from Haiyan, he told several friends a different story. Mr. Smith had made statements during her absence that he knew she was alive and well, that she had in contact with some mutual friends and other parties. But investigators found no one to confirm Smith's story. And he refused to take a lie detector test. Then, five months later, on the night of June 23rd, the suspect's car was pulled from the Muskegon River with a dead woman in it. The waiting was finally over. Having found the body, detectives secured a search warrant for David Smith's home, which he now shared with his new girlfriend. Technicians scoured the house, searching for the tiniest shred of evidence that might tell them whether a crime had happened here. The odds of finding anything were slim. But it had been almost a year since Haiyan's disappearance. And there was no guarantee that this was even the scene of the crime. Investigators used an alternative light source to search for clues a killer wouldn't think to clean up. This searchlight penetrates paint layers, making it easy to find the remnants of blood. The beam highlighted some smears on a kitchen wall. And below them, police found what they were looking for. Behind a freezer, minute traces of blood spatter stained the wall. Crime lab personnel uh, further expanded their search in the immediate area, and by removing the molding along the wall, we discovered a large area of contamination uh, from human blood. They believed this to be the scene of attack. From the pattern of the blood spatters, investigators were able to corroborate the medical examiner's findings. Someone had been beaten numerous times with a blunt object. From the amount of blood under the floor, it was likely that the person had been fatally wounded. But detectives faced a big problem. They were able to eliminate David as the source of the blood, but there were no records of Hai Yan's blood type. She had been in the water too long to determine it from her remains. DNA tests at the time also were not sensitive enough to be of use. Someone had been severely beaten in this kitchen, but detectives couldn't yet make an airtight case for murder. To arrest Smith, investigators needed some hard evidence to link him to Hai Yan's murder. In order to nail their suspect, police hoped to trap Smith in his own lies. He had told several people that he knew Hai Yan was alive as of January. If police could prove that she'd been in the water prior to then, they'd be able to prove that Smith had intentionally concealed the crime. But they had a major obstacle to overcome. We were able to show the cause of manner of death, but we were not able to determine by her state of preservation exactly when she died. Miller had an idea. He remembered that when the car was fished from the water, cocoons had been removed from the windshield and fender. He knew that insects are helpful in determining time of death on land. Could they do the same in the water? In order to tie David Smith to his wife's death, detectives in western Michigan needed to determine how long her body had been in the river. Their only clue was a cocoon. Police turned to forensic entomologist Richard Merritt to see if he could learn anything from this unlikely witness. Well, when I received the specimens from Detective Miller, I saw that they were black flies. And black flies are a group that I've been working on for the past 20 years. So I knew right away that uh, there was something there that I could identify and probably give some more information that they didn't have on the case. Merritt would rely on his knowledge of the black fly's life cycle to calculate when the car hit the water. Like all insects, the black fly goes through four life stages. The first stage is the egg. 
Black flies in the Muskegon River hatch in November or December, then turn into worm-like larvae. The larval black flies remain in that stage and grow during the winter in the river on any substrates that they can attach to. Could be leaves, could be uh, rocks, or in this case it was a car. In April or May, the larvae enter the pupil stage. They build cocoons around themselves and remain dormant until late May or early June when they emerge as adult flies to start the life cycle over again. The presence of cocoons on High Yon's car told Merritt that the vehicle had to have entered the water no later than November. For that particular species to be found on the car in late June as it was, the immature stage had to occur for the entire winter on the car in the river. Otherwise, you would not have had that particular species. Merritt's findings proved to Detective Miller that David Smith had completely fabricated the stories about his wife's whereabouts since her disappearance. He'd said she was seen in January. The cocoon said she'd been in the water since November. Mr. Smith had told co-workers and others that he knew his wife was alive and that she had contact with various people across the nation. Dr. Merritt's studies of the black fly larva and uh, the various stages we found on the vehicle proved positively those, that was simply not true, that she was immersed within the waters of the Muskegon River. The insects proved that Smith was lying, no doubt to cover his tracks. And apparently, his weren't the only set. When news of the murder investigation came out, a co-worker told police that a month before Hai Yan's disappearance, David had been trying to find a hitman. Police subpoenaed Smith's phone records. In September, there was an unusually high number of calls to two numbers in Pittsburgh. One was the dry cleaning plant where his father worked. The other was traced to the home of one of the father's co-workers, Kenny Lamont Latimer. When investigators confronted Latimer with the evidence heaping against his acquaintance, David Smith, Latimer crumbled. He told police that Smith had offered him $5,000 to kill his wife. By the time he'd hired Latimer, Smith's marriage was a wreck. But he was already paying alimony to a first wife and didn't want another liability. He hired Latimer to kill the victim with a dose of bad heroin. But the plan didn't work, so Smith beat her to death with a wooden statue. Smith and Latimer then put her into her car and pushed it into the river. Thanks to the unlikely testimony of a vacant cocoon, Smith was arrested in December of 1989. A jury found him guilty of murder and sentenced him to 15 to 20 years in prison. For their parts in the murder and conspiracy, Kenny Lamont Latimer received 20 to 60 years and Smith's father got three and a half to five. The improbable testimony of the black fly foiled David Smith's plot to cover up the murder of his wife. In Dana Point, California, detectives would rely on more improbable evidence to link a killer to his actions. For years, 46-year-old Janet Overton, a public official, had suffered from declining health. Though dizzy and weak, she was determined not to let illness keep her down. On a January morning in 1988, she looked forward to a family outing on the Pacific Ocean. She never made it past the driveway. Janet's husband, Richard, summoned paramedics. But Janet was beyond help. Within hours, she was dead. The autopsy that followed could do nothing to shed light on the cause of Janet Overton's death. 
A routine scan of her blood and tissues was performed in order to find commonly used substances. It eliminated all conventional over-the-counter or prescription drugs as having contributed to her death. Her strange illness seemed to be as much of a mystery in death as it had been in life. For four years, Overton suffered from weight loss, stomach aches, tingling in her fingers, and a rust-colored rash. None of the specialists could make a diagnosis, despite extensive testing for viral infections, allergies, bacterial problems, anything that could explain the strange illness. Toxicologist Paul Sedgwick was called in. They were completely baffled. They checked right and left. There are stacks of records a couple of feet high. And from whatever I can see, they never did find a specific cause for any of the symptoms that they found. All they knew was that Janet Overton had been ravaged from the inside out. After her death, blood and tissue samples were put into storage at the coroner's office. The body was cremated. Her death might have remained a medical curiosity, but then a tip phoned in to Lieutenant Tim Carney of the Orange County Sheriff's Department turned it into a homicide investigation. Six months after Janet Overton's demise, Richard Overton's first wife, Dorothy, told officers to take a good look at her ex-husband's past. Her daughter had made an odd discovery while visiting Overton's home. While going through some of Richard's things, she found a syringe, rubber gloves, and a tube of mascara. She reported them to her mother, who contacted the police. Carney dug through 20 years of records to uncover the Overton's family secret. Dorothy Boyer told us that after her divorce from her husband around 1967, that there was a series of years where she suspected her husband had been poisoning her. Like the second Mrs. Overton, Dorothy's health declined between 1967 and 1973. She would become violently ill without explanation. She was dizzy, her mouth tasted of metal. One day, she noticed a strong sulfuric smell coming from her shampoo. The same odor emanated from some of her food. She began to suspect that Richard, who had access to her house even after their divorce, was trying to kill her. To find out for sure, she laid a trap. With the help of the sheriff's department, Richard Overton's first wife, Dorothy, devised a plan to see if he was poisoning her. She cleaned a new coffee can with rubbing alcohol, then marked the lid so that she would know if it had been tampered with. The rest would be up to Richard. After three days, she discovered that someone had opened the lid. Fingerprints lifted from the can were compared to Richard's, taken when he applied for a municipal job. They matched. Without his ex-wife's permission, Richard Overton had snuck into her house, gone into the cupboards, and mixed some reddish powder into her coffee. When the contents were tested, investigators discovered a strong-smelling mineral called selenium. Selenium is an element which in small amounts is necessary for good nutrition and health. In large amounts, it's poisonous. Richard was brought in for questioning. He initially denied having poisoned Dorothy. But confronted with the evidence, he confessed. Dorothy agreed to drop the charges so long as Richard stayed out of her life. Now, 20 years later, Richard Overton faced another round of questions regarding the poisoning of his second wife, Janet. But before detectives could go after him, they needed to find out if selenium poisoning had contributed to the death of Janet Overton.
On paper, the two Mrs. Overtons seem to have suffered from the same undiagnosed ailment. According to Lieutenant Carney, it looked like history was repeating itself. What we looked at was comparing Dorothy Boyer's 1970, late 60s, early 70s medical history from doctors, along with Janet Overton's medical history in the 1980s. And what we saw was almost a mirror copy of symptomology of classic heavy metal poisoning. Dorothy Boyer, and now police, wondered if the mascara Richard's daughter found in his home contained selenium. In one simple test for selenium, the question sample is dissolved in a test tube. Hydrochloric acid and other chemicals are added. If the solution turns red, that indicates that selenium is present. Tests on the mascara showed it contained selenium. Detectives contacted the mascara manufacturer. Selenium, they learned, is not an ingredient in any of their cosmetics. If it was found in the product, it had to have been added after it was purchased. If high quantities of the mineral could also be detected in samples from the victim's body, investigators would have a solid foundation in their case against Richard Overton. To investigators' dismay, no abnormal amount of selenium was found in any of the victim's tissue samples. The investigation halted in its tracks. But it wouldn't be shut down for long, thanks to a lucky discovery in the lab. From the open vial of Janet Overton's stomach contents, Sedgwick was overpowered by the smell of bitter almonds, the signature of a far deadlier poison than selenium. And I knew instantly that there was cyanide from even two feet away. Only 50% of the population are genetically predisposed to smell cyanide. And because the original testing was done under a fuming hood, the smell was easy to miss. Had it not been for Sedgwick's chance discovery, it's likely that the cyanide would have stayed hidden forever. We didn't detect cyanide initially because it's one of the least, one of the less common compounds that we see. Um, it requires special testing and is not in the general screens that are initially called for. Sedgwick determined that Janet Overton's blood, brain, and stomach samples contained cyanide. Even a small dose of the white powder can be lethal. One year after Janet Overton's demise, her cause of death was ruled acute cyanide poisoning. To Detective Carney, Richard Overton appeared to be the most likely suspect. But poisoning cases are notoriously hard to solve. Forensics can be used to identify the deadly toxin, but are of little help in tying the poisoner to the body. Lieutenant Carney knew that he had an uphill battle. Proving a poison case can be difficult when time goes by. You still need to look at the aspects of the investigation, which include not only physical evidence, and we're talking about a years of, of uh, poisoning here, and also, you have to look at motive and opportunity. And so far, investigators had found neither. It was true that Richard Overton had a history of tampering, but in person, he hardly seemed the murderous sort. He was a bright, accomplished man who had nothing to gain from his wife's death. There was no financial motive. Janet's life insurance policy had been paid out to her son nor was there a history of violence. The 15-year marriage was loving and supportive, Richard said. At first, detectives didn't let on that they knew about his attempts to poison his first wife. They simply asked Richard who might have tried to poison Janet. He mentioned that his wife had enemies, stemming back to her involvement in local politics. Janet had also struggled with depression, he couldn't rule out the possibility that she had killed herself. 
Then, five hours into the interview, police dropped the bombshell. I confronted him with the 1973 investigation where he poisoned his former wife. He denied that to me until I showed him the documentation of the report. Challenged by his shady past, Overton abruptly ended the conversation and refused to contribute any further to the investigation. Detectives had caught Overton in a bold-faced lie. During an interview with a business associate, Mel Hubbard, they caught him in another. Overton had told detectives that he had no access to cyanide. Hubbard told a conflicting story. Mr. Hubbard informed us that, in fact, he does use cyanide in the extraction of gold and silver from ore samples in his mining operations, and he keeps cyanide at, at, on hand at his residence. Mr. Hubbard also informed me that Richard had keys to his residence and would care for his home when Hubbard was away during his mining operations. Discovering that Richard had had access to cyanide was like putting him in the same room with the murder weapon. To place that weapon firmly in his grip, detectives would need to find motive. Without it, they'd have little chance of getting this case to court, and even less of a chance of a conviction. Armed with a search warrant, sheriffs descended on the suspect's home. They seized Richard's diaries, along with his computer, and 131 diskettes. Richard's children had told investigators that he kept a voluminous diary. First, he'd write notes longhand, and then he'd type more detailed versions into his computer. Finding some confession in the suspect's own words would be detectives' last chance at making their case. Careful inspection showed that some of the writing had been manipulated. Entries had been whited out. The page corresponding to the date of Janet's death had been removed. By using an ultraviolet light to see through the whiteout, investigators learned that Richard suspected Janet of having an affair. There was the possible motive, but investigators needed more to prove it. Detectives hoped to find answers in Richard's computer files. They spent hours scouring the hard drive and opening diskette after diskette, but they came up empty-handed. It seemed that Richard had erased or written over almost all of his electronic diary. But then, detectives noticed something strange. At the bottom of one of the documents were a few jumbled lines of text. And in the text were phrases that suggested diary entries. Perhaps the data wasn't gone after all. But how to retrieve it from the computer? Detectives in Orange County, California, believed that Richard Overton's computer would tie him to the poisoning death of his wife, Janet. But Overton had erased his hard drive and diskettes. Data retrieval experts were called in to launch the first forensic computer probe in Orange County history. Though Overton had cleansed files, computer experts like William Riddle knew that there was a good chance the information was still on the computer. What most people don't know is that once you delete a file off a computer or a disk, and the information that was in the file actually are still there on the computer. It's just that the computer has turned a small flag or a, a character and has told the table of contents section of the computer that this space is now available for storage. So uh, something can be overwritten in this space. Inside a computer, media is stored in files as magnetic information. Sometimes that information overlaps. The process is like typing and retyping over the same sheet of paper. Riddle began his work by copying all of Overton's computer files. This way, he wouldn't risk losing the data for good during his investigation. He installed a specialized computer program on their systems, then set about the grueling process of opening files one at a time. The program removes layers of text, leaving behind bits and pieces of documents that were once stored there. 
it took hundreds of hours to expose the raw, unformatted tangle of text. But that was only the beginning. Using the handwritten diary as a reference, technicians then sorted through the files, piecing together Richard Overton's diary word by word. From the jumble, technicians were finally able to reassemble Richard Overton's secret diary, and with it, his intention to kill his wife. The recovery of Overton's damning words would prove to be a turning point in the case. Though the suspect had proclaimed that he and the victim had a loving marriage, his own words, pulled from electronic oblivion, would prove otherwise. In fact, there was a point in the discs where Richard Overton stated that his love-hate relationship for his wife had turned purely to hate and that something was going to happen very soon. This was just a few short days before her death on January 24th. Investigators surmised that Richard was angry about his wife's infidelity and resentful that she'd achieved political success without a formal education. As he had done with his first wife, he added selenium to his wife's beauty products and food to set up a long-term illness. At some point, he'd stopped giving her the selenium and it cleared from her body. Then, he administered a single lethal dose of cyanide to kill her. He thought that no one would ever be able to catch him. And he was nearly right. Had it not been for his own writings, detectives would have had only their suspicions. After years of investigation, they now had both motive and opportunity. The information retrieved from the computer disks convinced the jury that Richard Overton had plotted for years to kill his wife. After only six hours of deliberation, they found him guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Even in the wasteland of computer files, beer bottles, and insect cocoons, a keen investigator can find a murder conviction. The most pivotal clues are sometimes waiting to be uncovered from the most unlikely sources. A heart surgeon appears to have died by his own hand. But forensic science gives investigators a second opinion. To solve a woman's brutal murder, investigators must rely on forensic techniques that haven't been invented yet. But time is on their side. A senseless murder becomes even more perplexing when investigators find two strange marks on the victim. They could mean nothing or everything. Even when the scene of a murder reads like a page of pulp fiction, detectives must somehow piece together the plot. So too must the writers who tell the stories of true crime. History began on a cold Monday morning in February 1996 in Sims Township, Ohio. The usually punctual heart surgeon, Dr. Darrell Sutorius, missed his morning rounds at the hospital for the second day in a row. Attempts to page him brought no response. His colleagues asked the Hamilton County Sheriff's Department to check on the doctor at home. His wife, Della Dante Sutorius, said she didn't know where her husband was. She hadn't seen him in days. But that wasn't unusual. Though they lived under the same roof, the couple led separate lives. 
She often went weeks without seeing him. The police asked if they could look around the home. First, they checked to see if the doctor's car was in the garage. When they found it, the engine was cold. He hadn't driven it recently. Their search was cut short by a scream. In a basement room, Daryl Sutorius had been found. His head lay in a pool of blood. A steel 38 caliber revolver gleamed on the carpet. After devoting his life to healing others, it appeared the doctor had killed himself. His wife of little more than a year was now a widow. The officers on the scene couldn't foresee that this was the beginning of a case that would be read by hundreds of thousands of true crime fans. As news of the death was splashed across the pages of the Cincinnati newspapers, it caught the attention of best-selling crime writer Aphrodite Jones. It was the front page of all the papers, and I heard I, people were talking about it, and you know, I went and grabbed the papers right out on the bookstand, and I just said, whoa, this is it. I, I just immediately knew this was my story. I had to have this story. It was like falling in love. This story would become Jones's fourth true crime book. The Sutorius case had all the right ingredients, deception, betrayal, and death. At the scene, there was every indication the victim's death was a suicide. The gun was collected, and gun metal tests on the victim's hands proved that he had fired the weapon. To try to understand why the victim would take his own life, police questioned his wife, Della. She told them they were practically estranged. In her few encounters with her husband in the weeks before his death, he seemed angry and depressed. He had good reason. Daryl and Della had fought often, mostly about money. To keep the peace, they agreed to live on different floors of the large house they shared. Della believed that her husband had killed himself rather than face a painful divorce. While Della had her say, forensics experts were finding a different story at the scene. Though the doctor may have been lonely, police were not convinced he was by himself when he died. Investigators weren't ready to write it off to suicide just yet. Police found a second bullet lodged in the rug. When the pistol was examined, it was found that two shots, not one, had been fired. Strange as it seems, according to coroner Carl Parrott, that's not unheard of in suicide cases. Some suicides do include multiple shots. Some suicides include a test shot, a so-called test shot. It's uh, theorized that people uh, discharge the weapon just to see how loud it is. But another clue was not so easily dismissed. Among the blood spatters was a smear on the couch cushion. From the position of the mark, it was unlikely that he could have made it as he fell. Sutorius could not have killed himself and then smeared his own blood. It looked as if someone had altered the scene. Parrott also noticed something odd about the position of the body. The victim's right hand was extended out from the couch directly over the gun. It looked like the gun had fallen from his lifeless fingers. But the blood spatter contradicted that. On the Palmer surface, there was sprayed or spattered blood. Sprayed blood. Um, implies that this surface of the hand was up and exposed to blood which is uh, exhaled during terminal respiration. Now, however, the hand is out like this. The victim's position had apparently changed after the fatal shot. There was no other way to explain the blood on his hand. 
The head wound was unlike any suicide Dr. Parrott had ever seen. The gunshot wound of entrance was above the superior attachment of the, of the, the right ear. And the trajectory was front going at about 45, approximately 45 degrees. This was also a non-contact wound. The entrance wound was high at the back of the head, and the gun had to have been fired from some distance away. People typically don't pull the weapon well behind. This is an uncomfortable position to adopt, particularly when you're lying down. It was unlikely that a surgeon so well versed in anatomy would have risked missing his mark. It now looked like the doctor had been murdered. The irregularities at the scene were incriminating, but not damning. To prove murder, investigators would have to first prove that someone else pulled the trigger. The prime suspect was the victim's widow, Della Sutorius but they lacked solid evidence. A little less than a year. To find out more about the couple's relationship, detectives well, talked to friends and relatives. The doctor's attorney revealed that Daryl Sutorius had confided that he was afraid of his wife and wanted to end their marriage. Well, In fact, his divorce papers were waiting well. to be executed on the same day his body was found. And, uh, the fact is, that I'm contradicted what Della had told police. Either Sutorius had changed his mind about seeking now, divorce, or I Della was lying. But I need to get out of this. Where are the kids now? Are they with her? The case against Della was building. Hamilton County, Ohio's chief assistant prosecutor, Tom Langano, was brought in. To our case, the forensic evidence was most important, coupled with the facts that she had made statements to people that she would do him bodily harm, and Daryl, in fact, had confided in friends and relatives that he was in fear for his life, that Della had threatened to kill him. It seemed that Della had made good on her threats. But first, she cast her spell on Sutorius. Investigators learned that the lonely doctor had met his bride-to-be through a dating service and had rushed to the altar only three months later seduced by her lies. The honeymoon hadn't lasted long. Della Sutorius' stylish cover story soon opened onto page after page of dime novel violence and deception. And she was posing as somebody named Dante, and he didn't care. And she was posing as somebody who went to UCLA and graduated from college, and he never checked on it. And she was posing as somebody who had all this fantastic knowledge of the arts, etc. He never knew anything about that. He knew she looked good in a bathing suit. She claimed that she loved him, and that's all he cared about. She had no college education as she purported, and until she set her sights on the doctor, she was in constant need of money. She'd been married four times before, not twice, as she said during their brief courtship. She had been Della Hoffer, Della Beyer, Della Bassett, and Della Britton. Each of her relationships had ended in angry divorces. Her marriage to Sutorius seemed to be following the same course. Della and the doctor's fights over money became increasingly bitter. Their rancor reached new heights when the surgeon's daughter announced her wedding plans. Della refused to allow Sutorius to pay for his daughter's wedding. Della had a fanatical need to fuel her spendthrift ways. Without a prenuptial agreement, she would gain little from a divorce. They were not married very long, and under Ohio law, she was not really entitled to much by way of financial settlement. On the other hand, if he had died of a suicide or natural causes, she stood to inherit about a million dollars. It was to Della's benefit to prevent the divorce. Did that mean murder? Perhaps. But investigators needed hard evidence to make the case. The peek into her past revealed her capacity for violence. She had set one boyfriend on fire while he slept. She threatened another with a gun. This cycle of violence escalated throughout her life. So it went from being just 
throwing things around with husband number one, throwing dishes and that kind of thing, to then all of a sudden, um, you know, destroying property of the car and this and that with husband number two, to then destroying homes, to then then pulling knives, and with the last husband, she took a gun and pulled the trigger at his head. It was empty. The bullets were not in the gun, but she didn't know that. She didn't know that. She was ready to kill David Britton. He testified to that in court. She was going to blow his head off. In the case of Daryl Sutorius, it appeared that Della may have succeeded in her murderous plans. Yes, I'm looking for a gun for self-defense. Okay. Investigators traced the serial number on the gun that killed the doctor. It's a 38 revolver. It was yeah, registered to Della Sutorius, purchased shortly before the murder. Further checks revealed that this was not the first pistol she'd owned. An officer on the case recalled that several months before the shooting, a man had approached him to turn in a 22 caliber handgun. I have a gun in the trunk that I'd like to give you. He said it belonged to his wife, and that she had threatened him with it. That man was Daryl Sutorius. The officer told him to hand over the weapon at the police station and to file charges of domestic violence. The gun was turned in, but he didn't file charges. So he thought he got the gun out of the house and he was safe. Little did he know, she went out and bought herself another gun. The owner of the gun shop where Della bought her second pistol remembered that she was a tough customer. He told police that even though a shooting lesson was included in the price of the weapon, Della didn't need it. She was a natural dead eye. And with the loaded pistol in her hand, she would told him she wouldn't let her husband get away with divorce. But hearsay about threats still wasn't enough to bring charges. Investigators had to place her in the room with the smoking gun. The death of Dr. Daryl Sutorius looked like murder. Investigators had learned that his wife, Della, had both motive and opportunity to kill him. But could they raise tangible evidence to prove it? Coroner Carl Parrott thought he could. He noted that a thin sheen of blood covered practically all of the gun's surfaces. Occasionally you'll see blood on a weapon after a suicide. But the distribution is where you'd expect it to be, on the muzzle, front sight, maybe the front of the trigger guard. The places you would not expect to see it are on the grips, which are shielded by the shooter's hand. Parrott found a partial bloody palm print left on the grip of the weapon. He determined that the print had been transferred to the grip by a blood-stained hand when the blood was almost dry. Given the lethal nature of his wound, Dr. Sutorius could not have shot himself, dropped the gun, and then picked it up again. Finally, here was proof positive that a second person had been at the scene. The print was too smeared to compare it with Della's, but Della Sutorius had no alibi for the weekend her husband lay dead in the basement. When all the evidence was assembled, the events of the doctor's last day alive became clear. The style to which Della Sutorius had grown accustomed was slipping through her fingers. Pressure was mounting. Divorce was imminent. On Saturday, February 17th, she reached the end of her rope and the end of the eight-day waiting period to pick up her new gun. After shooting her sleeping husband, she arranged his body to make it appear that he had killed himself. Then she placed the gun in the lifeless hand and pulled the trigger once more, making the bullet hole in the floor. Now, gunshot residue would be found on the doctor's hand by any forensic expert who looked for it. February 27, 1996, 
the widow was arrested for the murder of her husband. In her book, Della's Web, Aphrodite Jones described the final moments of the trial four months later. The sordid saga of Della Dante Fay Hall Hofer Beyer Bassett Britton Sutorius ended on June 7, 1996. A tear rolled down her face as she listened to closing arguments. Then Della collapsed in her chair as the jury announced the verdict, guilty of aggravated murder in the death of her husband. The widow Sutorius was sentenced to life in prison. She will be 70 years old before she's eligible for parole. Though many homicides are solved with the tools at hand, sometimes the clues, and ultimately the victim, must wait for new technology to reveal their secrets. Best-selling true crime writers Don Weber and Charles Bosworth Jr. found themselves thrust into the midst of just such a case in June 1978 in the quiet town of Wood River, Illinois. Carla Brown had just gotten engaged to her high school sweetheart, David Hart, and they were moving in together. Hart went to work as usual, leaving Brown to start arranging their home. But later that morning, when a friend stopped by to see the new house, Brown didn't come to the door. After work, Hart gave his friend a tour he couldn't understand why his fiancée had gone out and left the door unlocked. Carla, you gotta be in the basement. As they walked through the house, the reason became horribly clear. Carla, Carla! Carla Brown hadn't gotten far in her unpacking before she was attacked. Police found her on her knees, doubled over, with her head in a bucket of water. Her hands were lashed behind her back. She was naked from the waist down. Police questioned David Hart. He was inconsolable. His co-workers confirmed that Brown had been murdered while he was at work. He was not a suspect. Detectives processed the scene for clues. Slashed electrical wire had been used to bind the victim's hands. She had two linear bruises on her face and neck. She had been sexually assaulted. Socks tied around her throat suggested she'd been strangled. A pool of water, tinted pink from the victim's blood, was found beneath one end of the couch. More blood led from the couch to the body. But the most perplexing clue lay not on the floor, but overhead. The carafe from a coffee maker was jammed into the rafters. Illinois State Police Crime Scene Inspector Alva Bush didn't trust what he saw at the scene. He had worked many homicides involving sexual assault and felt that the position of the victim meant the scene had been staged. The victim was bound around one wrist, and then the cord went underneath her and came up, and the other wrist was tied. And I felt that this wasn't right because it would allow the victim access to her attacker. Inspector Bush made sure a painstaking series of photographs was taken of the entire scene. Then the body was wrapped in a sheet so that no trace evidence would be lost during transport to the coroner's lab. When the victim's injuries were examined, it was determined that she'd been struck a single devastating blow. It had broken her jaw in two places and left two blunt trauma bruises on her face. The marks suggested the back of a claw hammer Though Carla Brown had fiercely resisted her attacker, she'd been overpowered and possibly knocked unconscious. Ultimately, her cause of death was drowning. Charles Bosworth, Jr., a reporter who covered this case for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, experienced firsthand the community's fear and outrage. 
This was a murder that happened uh, in the home of a, of a lovely young woman minding her own business, moving into a home, starting a new life with her fiance. Uh, it happened in, the, in broad daylight and it immediately raised the issue for us of, of the, the lack of safety in a person's own home. And that terrifies the public. Co-author Don Weber, who in 1978 was the assistant state's attorney, was called into the case. The criminal, whoever he was, undermined any sense of safety. The hardware stores sold out of locks. Uh, women were afraid to go anywhere by themselves. The impression I got when I went to the house was it was just a terrible, brutal, cold-blooded crime, and there were absolutely no clues. Police interviewed Carla Brown's neighbors. One witness said that on the day of the murder, she'd seen two men drinking beer and smoking marijuana in the yard of the house next door to the crime scene. The two men were brought in for polygraph tests. John Prenti passed the test, displaying no abnormal responses to the questions. But when Dwayne Conway's turn came, the results were declared inconclusive due to erratic emotional disturbances. Only a disturbed mind could commit a crime like this one. Conway became the lead suspect but the crime scene gave as many mixed signals as his polygraph. No identifiable fingerprints were found at the crime scene. The case reached an impasse. After a year, even though Carla Brown's killer was still at large, the murder investigation was called off. Then, a chance encounter over 1,000 miles away broke it open. Uh, yes. A murder case may be officially closed, but it's never forgotten. That was true of the Carla Brown case. In 1979, almost a year after the crime, investigator Alva Bush traveled from Illinois to New Mexico to testify in an unrelated stolen vehicle case. When that trial was delayed, he passed the time attending a seminar on a brand new forensic technology photographic image enhancement. He had no idea this seminar would be the turning point for the Brown investigation. The lecturer that day was medical investigator Homer Campbell. On most photographs, there's more information uh, than you really perceive. And what uh, enhancement does uh, in different steps, it really simplifies the photograph. Uh, it makes the edges clear, uh, for instance. Uh, it lets you see different segments of the film differently. With renewed hope, Bush sent photographs of the Carla Brown murder scene to Campbell for analysis. He hoped this new technology would help solve an old case. The photographs were enhanced using a computer that pared away only the blurred fragments of each image one tiny section at a time. In the Brown case, the results were dramatic. Campbell called Bush with his initial findings. The twin bruising on the victim's face had been caused when the killer struck her with the metal legs of a TV tray, which were barely visible in one photograph. The victim's former fiance, David Hart, still had the TV tray in his home. When police re-examined it, they discovered microscopic traces of blood and a short strand of blonde hair, but no fingerprints. Though the weapon had been found, the killer was still free. But Campbell's enhancement of the photographs provided even more shocking evidence of the killer's brutality. Oops. Then he kind of dropped the bomb on me when he says, uh, what about the bite marks on her ne neck? And I just couldn't believe it. I said, what bite mark? And he says, she's definitely got a bite mark on her neck. The enhanced image made it clear the victim had sustained a savage bite during her assault. Since the bite was inflicted close to her time of death, the bruises had no chance to heal but they'd still been too faint to draw notice until now.
The first thing is to examine the injury itself. And from the injury, what is the investigator able to see? Can he see uh, what's called gross characteristics? Can he see little individual characteristics, maybe something individual about this that would really make it different from anything else? Campbell determined that Carla Brown's killer had a small mouth with crooked teeth. After one year with no breaks whatsoever, this gave police their first solid lead. We knew that we had something now that we could link to the killer, something very personal, something he's not going to change. I, I can recall that I was excited about it because I, I felt that this guy would have to pull all of his teeth out, at least most of the ones in front, to get away from this type of evidence. By the early 80s, forensic experts were depending more and more on the unique characteristics of bite marks. The prime suspect, Dwayne Conway, was forced by the court to have an impression made of his upper teeth. This mold was then sent to Dr. Campbell. By going to the teeth, you look again at the gross characteristics of the teeth. You look at the individual characteristics of the teeth. Something, you look for something a little different uh, that would make this individual. The photos simply didn't provide enough information. Without a clearer view of the bite wound, the case would grind to a halt. Stymied at every turn, there was only one path open to investigators. They started the paperwork to have Carla Brown's remains disinterred. But the investigation moved forward on another front. Detectives on the case learned that the new science of psychological profiling was helping police close murder cases across the country. Detective Bush and his colleagues wondered if a profiler could help them get inside the mind of Carla Brown's murderer. They gathered all the crime scene photos and drove more than 800 miles to the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit in Quantico, Virginia. There, pioneer profiler John Douglas studied the images and made a startling prediction. Douglas was just amazing. You know, he, he started just talking after he's seen the photographs and he says that um, the, the crime scene was definitely staged and that if we're going to exhume Carla's body that we need to do a lot of high profile news media on it and he says that this guy the killer will call you he'll contact you and he'll want to inject himself into the investigation the timing of this new information couldn't have been better in May of 1982, four years after her death, permission to exhume Carla Brown's remains was finally granted. As the FBI profiler recommended, the police and the media cooperated, making a public event of the grim proceeding. To further shake up the murderer, investigators publicized the previously unknown fact that the victim had a bite mark on her body and that an arrest in the case was imminent. According to Assistant State's Attorney Don Weber, this was all-out psychological warfare. We were trying to make the killer nervous. He'd coped with the crime. He'd learned that he got away with it. He was really proud of himself. And John Douglas said, you have to make him nervous. While new photos were being taken of the bite marks on the victim, Weber's office received a telephone call from the prime suspect's friend. During an office meeting we were having about this case, my secretary broke in and said, John Pranty's on the phone. Though Pranty had passed a polygraph and wasn't a suspect, he was behaving like the killer. That wouldn't work out. The profiler said the killer would try to insinuate himself oh, into yeah, the investigation. Right. The That's what John Pranty was doing. The publicity surrounding Brown's exhumation and the bite wound also brought out new witnesses who called investigators with crucial information. 
They said that at a party just one week after Carla Brown's death, Pranty had been describing the murder scene to his friends in lurid detail, including a description of the bite mark. The only way he could have known about the mark three years before the police learned of it was if he'd inflicted the wound himself. Pranty was ordered to give a dental impression. The mold, along with the impressions of three other people, were forwarded to a forensic odontologist for analysis. We brought him four sets of dental impressions, and we said, which one is our killer? And he put three aside immediately, and then he took up Pranny's dental impressions, and he measured them, and he got a caliper out, and he looked at the picture, and then he just sat down, and he said, that's your man. Extreme patience and new forensic techniques had finally justified an arrest warrant. On June 8, 1982, four years after the murder of Carla Brown, John Pranty was arrested. One thing about a homicide investigation, they're forever. There's nothing sacred in them. There's, you continue to search for that individual. There's no statute of limitations that you have to deal with. So if somebody out there has done a murder, you're fair game forever until it's solved. When the evidence was assembled, police sketched a picture of the victim's first morning in her new home and her last day alive. Pretty made a sexual advance that was strongly rebuffed. The struggle escalated until Pranty bit Brown on the neck and struck her face with the TV tray, knocking her unconscious. He tried to revive her by splashing water on her face from the coffee carafe. When his efforts failed, he redressed her and tied socks around her neck to hide the bite mark, bound her hands, and tipped her forward into the bucket of water, where she drowned. After Pranty fled the scene, he washed the telltale blood from his hands at the home of next door neighbor, Dwayne Conway. Thanks to the emerging sciences of image enhancement, forensic odontology, and psychological profiling, Carla Brown's killer was finally brought to justice. Those interminable seconds, the period of time Don Weber hated more than anything else, passed as the verdict was handed from the foreman to the bailiff to the young judge. Reading his first trial verdict, Judge Romani said solemnly, the verdict the court has been handed reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant, John Pranty, guilty of the offense of murder. On September 27, 1982, Pranty was sentenced to 75 years in prison. While the process of solving a crime can bring welcome resolution, it can also stir up some ugly ghosts from the past. Clifford Leindecker has been a true crime writer for 22 years. He has published 32 books to date. Being a crime writer is the greatest job in the world. Uh, every book or every magazine piece I do, uh, I get to look into the lives of new people, uh, look into the deaths of new people too, for that matter. But uh, you really see uh, life at, at, its, uh, at its rawest. You strip everybody's secrets away, and uh, if, you're, if you're a snoop, a former uh, journalist, so that's, uh, that's, that can be pretty exciting. In the last century, Leo Tolstoy wrote that every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Leindecker found that it's still true and still makes good reading. I kind of pride myself on keeping up on what's happening with, uh, with true crime, and especially my favorites now, which I call family murders. In 1993, Leindecker learned of a brutal murder case in the resort town of Steamboat Springs, Colorado. It began in October at the hardware store owned by Jerry and Douglas Boggs. On this morning, Jerry was very late for work and Douglas was worried. 
Douglas tried to reach his older brother by phone. No one answered. When he went to Jerry's house to check on him, Hello, Douglas found him brutally murdered on the kitchen floor. An officer from the Steamboat Springs Police Department responded to Douglas Boggs's call. He confirmed that Jerry Boggs was past all help. Though there was a deep gash across the victim's forehead, death had come from two gunshots to the back. Detective Rick Kratz was called to the scene and noticed something unusual. In looking at uh, Jerry Boggs' body, there was, there was a mark uh, that on his ear and in his cheek right here that we could never figure out what the mark was. Um, it was kind of reddish and circular, and, and there was a spot up on the lobe of his ear. But, I mean, we'd... we'd uh, we guessed uh, at the onset that this is a muzzle of a gun being shoved into his head, and that was the bruising and the mark left uh, by a gun muzzle. A blood-stained shovel was discovered at the crime scene. It provided another possible explanation for the marks. If the victim had been struck with the tool, the rivets could have made the wounds. Police also found a slug and blood drops on the floor, along with pools of blood. As agent Tom Griffin examined the blood spatters, the full savagery of the murder became clearer. This convergence of stains, this three-dimensional convergence, uh, was basically underneath the ceiling beam. Uh, the ceiling beam had a curved gouge in it which was suspected to be a result of the shovel, the blade of the shovel coming in contact with the ceiling beam. Investigators collected several shell casings. Perhaps they could hold a clue to lead them to the killer. Forensic experts continued to build the case. After the fatal slugs were removed from the victim, they were submitted to the firearms lab at the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. There, Agent Alan Hammond went to work. I was able to determine that the bullets were 22 long rifle caliber. They had been fired from a barrel of a firearm that had rifling of eight lands and grooves with a right twist. Detectives had a bullet, but no gun. They had a shovel, but no clue as to who wielded it. Why would you By now, the killer could be miles away or very close to home. Police in Colorado had few leads and fewer suspects in the shooting death of Jerry Boggs. They turned their attention to the man closest to the victim, his brother, Doug. Well, Doug, Doug Boggs found the body. So at that point in time, everybody you know, everybody that, that uh, um, is associated with, with that is, is a suspect. Well, I left when I went to look for him. What time Blood and hair samples were taken there? from Doug Boggs and compared to forensic evidence from the scene. No match was found. Doug was not the killer, but he did point investigators to a suspect. His former sister-in-law, Jill Coit. Jerry Boggs had met Coit while she was restoring her bed and breakfast in town. She bought all her hardware at the Boggs' store, and soon the lifelong bachelor allowed no one but himself to wait on her. After their wedding in April of 1991, Jerry Boggs assumed part ownership of Jill Coit's bed and breakfast. But soon, Jerry and Jill began having marital trouble. Boggs was shocked to learn that his wife was still married to another man. Boggs insisted they separate until she ended her other marriage. Jill left, but as writer Clifford Leindecker discovered in researching his book, Jill returned to Steamboat Springs, making an amazing claim. 
Jill either rented or borrowed a baby and showed up in Steamboat Springs and went around town showing everybody and said, this is, uh, this is Jerry's baby, and uh, this rotten guy threw me out of the house, and uh, he won't take care of me, and he won't support his little girl. The child couldn't be his, or even hers. A partial hysterectomy years before had left Jill Coit unable to have more children. What was Coit up to? To find out, Boggs hired a private detective. The results of her report were startling. The private investigators actually turned up quite a history for Jill, and of course they relayed, relayed that to Jerry. Coit had been married not once, but 11 times before Jerry Boggs to nine different men. Like her marriage to Boggs, several of her other marriages had overlapped. Boggs had his marriage annulled, and soon Coit sued him for his share of the bed and breakfast. The case was bitterly contested. Investigators wondered if this was a motive for murder. If Coit's long string of marriages wasn't enough, police found another skeleton rattling in her closet. In Texas, one of Jill Coit's former husbands had also met an untimely death decades before. Now, when we began to investigate Jill Coit, I mean, she had, uh, we'd uncovered, I mean, numerous marriages, and several of, of those marriages were bigamous. We, we uh, found out uh, that uh, she was a prime suspect in a, a murder of a previous husband, William Coit in Houston, and it was like 21 years earlier, 20 years earlier. Um, and and uh, following up on, on that murder, I mean, the murders were, were phenomenally similar. William Coit, like Jerry Boggs, had been shot in the back at close range, the 22 caliber bullets piercing his lungs. For lack of evidence, Jill Coit was never charged in William Coit's death. It seemed history was about to repeat itself. Investigators in the Jerry Boggs murder faced the same circumstances. Then, one of Jerry Boggs' neighbors revealed a startling piece of information. She told police that on the day of the murder, she had seen two men walking by her house. What caught her eye was that they were wearing heavy coats on a mild fall afternoon. Then she realized that one of the men was actually a woman wearing a false mustache. Jerry Boggs' attorney confirmed that he and his wife had once seen a woman disguised as a man driving past the courthouse. The woman was definitely Jill Coit. We learned during the subsequent investigation that Jill Coit did this. She dressed up as a man, wore beard and mustache, and she'd use this disguise to follow Jerry Boggs around town, you know, uh, spying on him. Police suspected that the two mysterious men were really Jill and her boyfriend, Michael Backus. But Jill Coit told police that at the time of Jerry Boggs' murder, she and Backus were away camping. Police had no solid leads to support an arrest. As the investigation stalled, Coit sped to the airport, clutching tickets to Mexico. Police could only watch as she boarded a flight to freedom. Two men were dead, killed 20 years apart. Both were shot in the back with 22 caliber pistols, and both had been married to Jill Coit. She was the prime suspect in the death of Jerry Boggs, but she was still in Mexico, beyond the reach of authorities. Even if she returned to the States, coincidence was not strong enough evidence for police to bring charges. Then, According to crime writer Clifford Leindecker, a surprise witness turned the case around. I think the turning point in the investigation really occurred when Jill's oldest son, Seth, Stephen Seth, uh, turned against her. Not only had Jill Coit and Michael Backus openly planned the murder of Jerry Boggs in front of her son, She'd even called him when the butchery was finished, telling him, it's done and it's messy. 
Seth had reason to believe her. He'd found evidence of the deed in a bathroom sink at the bed and breakfast, where she may have washed up. With Seth Coit's testimony, police now had a case. But they couldn't act until Jill Coit came back to Colorado. Finally, in November 1993, investigators got a call from her son once again. He said that Jill Coit was making a quick visit to the US to tie up some loose ends on the sale of a property. Though she sneaked into town in the dead of night, police were waiting for her. As it turned out, Jill Coit and Michael Backus would be staying in Steamboat Springs much longer than they had planned. When detectives searched the suspect's car, they found spent 22 caliber cartridges in the ashtray. And then they discovered a weapon they weren't even searching for. A stun gun. What do you think of this? A stun gun uses two electrodes to deliver a non-lethal shock of 100,000 volts. It can incapacitate a human being for several minutes. Suddenly, the strange marks on the victim's face and neck began to make sense. But forensic data on stun gun injuries was scarce because they were so rarely fatal. Detective Kratz contacted the Arapahoe County coroner, Dr. Michael Doberson, for help. Just by measuring the distance from the electrodes on the stun gun, we were able to compare that with the injury that we saw in the picture and um, found that these injuries were, were pretty closely related to where the electrodes would have been. Though autopsy photographs gave some clues about the marks on the body, only tissue samples from the victim's remains would prove that a stun gun caused the marks. If investigators could find tissue damage consistent with the use of a stun gun, they could connect Jill Coit to the murder scene. But by now, Jerry Boggs's remains had been buried for 10 months. They were exhumed to look for evidence. Doberson found some. Not only was there an injury on the cheek, but there were also similar types of injuries or scratches on the earlobe and also on the outside of the ear. Samples of the injuries were closely analyzed. Because skin tissue is electrically charged, high voltage can disturb its structure. Near the surface of the damaged area, the skin had greatly thinned out the charged nuclei of all the cells had begun to align and migrate beneath the surface like iron filings on a magnet or a school of fish in a current. But this current wasn't water, it was electricity, lots of it. To Doberson, the results were conclusive. The skin showed all the signs of an electrical injury. The stun gun in Jill Coit's car linked her to the injuries on her ex-husband's body. After months of investigation, police now knew what had happened on the day Jerry Boggs died. Jill Coit and Michael Backus had ambushed Jerry Boggs soon after he'd come home. The victim was assaulted with the stun gun first, then beaten with the shovel. Three gunshots later, the crime was complete. Once her husband was back in Culver, she worked quickly. Clifford Leindecker's book, Poisoned Vows, details the end of the sordid tale. The jury deliberated only five hours before returning verdicts against both defendants of guilty to all counts. She picked the wrong town, she picked the wrong man, and she picked the wrong family, Douglas Boggs said of his former sister-in-law after the verdicts were revealed. For their crimes, Jill Coit and Michael Backus were sentenced to life in prison. Forensic evidence, both from the scene and from the grave, had unraveled the mystery. When the plot is murder, 
investigators must piece together the real story from a tangle of seemingly unrelated clues. As long as killers think they are above the law, there will always be tales of true crime. But forensic science will always write the final chapter. Music